Hey guys and welcome back to the channel and we're going to be going over a contender profile so very similar to the US Open player profiles we did I'm going to be doing a host of ATP and WTA contender profiles for specific players players that I think will be able to compete and potentially win the Australian Open title so we're going to do Stefanos it's fast today so do get involved let me know in the comments section your thoughts on Stefanos it's fast and whether you agree or disagree on my take before we get into it though remember to that like button and do subscribe if you are new thank you so much for tuning in as always also do leave a rating or review if you're listening on a podcast platform thank you to all our members as always, your guys' support is fantastic and genuinely, it is extremely helpful. Okay, let's get into this then. Stefanos sits a pass at the Australian Open 2023. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about his form recently. Uh, so in the last you know few months, of course, we're at the start of the year. So I will be also talking a little bit about 2022 on top of also talking a little bit about how his game and style of play translates onto the surfaces at the Australian Open in Melbourne. Is it suited? Is it not particularly suited? How does he fare? And then also tie in his Australian Open results as well, since he's been playing at the top level, at the pro level on the ATP Tour. And then ultimately, I'll give you guys my prediction about where I think, one, he will end up finishing in terms of expected result, and two, where I think his expectations will be. So two different things there as well. Okay, let's get into it then. So for Stefanos Tsitsipas, his recent form, very recent form we're talking, has been good at the United Cup, that is. The United Cup, he had four matches. He won all four of them against some pretty good opposition at that as well. He played Berrettini, uh, which was a very tight match. Berrettini played some really good tennis. Uh, two tiebreakers. They won one tiebreaker apiece, and then he won the decider 6-4 against Chorich. Bageled him, then lost the tiebreaker, then beat him 7-5 in the decider. Goffani beating straight sets and Dimitrov, he won a final set tiebreaker. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, then he played a couple of exhibitions in the UAE, which don't technically count towards his pro career and his actual playing record, but they're there as noted wins, uh, you know, if you want to take in exhibition results as well. And he beat Rublev, Sitsipas, and Nori. Uh, ironically, he had actually lost to Nori in the Diria Cup, uh, which was in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, only eight days earlier. And also ironically is the fact that he played Rublev a month later at the exhibition beating him. But the month earlier was when he lost him in the ATP finals and he came out after and said that Rublev had a very limited game. He has come out since and apologized, and I think rightfully so, because I think maybe a little bit of bitterness in that loss and he was expected expecting himself to win especially after some really good results uh, not just at the ATP finals but in previous tournaments and the reason why I say that is he beat Daniel Medvedev on an indoor hard court which is a very very impressive feat in a very tight affair uh, you know ended up winning the finals at 7-6 in a very good tiebreaker, lost to Djokovic in two sites, two tight sets, sorry, even at the ATP finals, and also lost him in a tight uh, Paris Masters semi final, losing 7 4 in a deciding tiebreaker. So he's had some good results. He really has on the hard courts, uh, no doubt. And I think for me, he'll be looking at, you know, the Australian Open and saying, well, I've actually made semi finals in the last two years. I should be pushing for the title here. So I've talked about a little bit about his recent form and results and obviously some really notable wins there. Uh, he did lose to a couple of informed players at the back end of last year on the hard courts, indoor hard, that is. Uh, you know, Holger Rune being one, uh, Djokovic a couple of times. Uh, but, you know, that that's expected really at that stage of the year. And Holger Rune, of course, went on to win Paris and Djokovic went on to win the two tournaments that he lost to him in which was in Astana and the ATP finals. So 
there's no real shame in that whatsoever. Uh, ranked number four in the world, so his projected trajectory, given his seeding, will be, you know, to make the semi-finals. I think he'll be seeded number three, given that Alcaraz is, won't be playing the Australian Open, unfortunately, as he had to pull out due to injury. So, Sitsipas has had a very interesting, for me anyway, results has had very interesting results at the Australian Open. So we can go over that now, actually. As I said, he's made the semifinals of the last two tournaments, also then made the semifinal in 2019. In 2020, he lost in the third round, and in 2018, he lost in the first round. So, you know, that, that's quite interesting. Last year, he lost to Daniel Medvedev. No real shame in that, of course, and Medvedev was two sets to love up against the die in the final, ultimately couldn't close it out, but you know, again, there's no real, there's no real shame in that. I don't think personally. I just think he got beaten by the better player on the day, unfortunately, um, and that can happen. He lost to Milos Raonic in 2020 um, at the Australian Open, which again at that time, even though Raonic probably was a little bit injury prone at that time, he was number number 32 in the world, massive serve. I mean, he causes issues for anyone on his day. So that, that's not a huge issue, I don't think. Uh, but for Sitsipas, you know, he obviously has some fond memories there. And against Medvedev last year, I was really impressed with it, the, with the performance he put in. I thought it was really good, genuinely. Uh, you know, he ended up losing in four sets eventually, but the first set was a tie break. He takes that. He won the second one 6-4. Third one 6-4, so it's tight um, to Medvedev there. And then Medvedev takes the last set, the fourth set, that is 6-1. So, look, he beat Sinner the, the round before in straight sets. Taylor Fritz in a very tight match in five. He seems to have, uh, you know, some some good feelings out there in Australia, um, especially on Rod Laver as well. So, I'm expecting some pretty impressive results from him, genuinely. How does his game, though, translate onto the surface, I think, is the big question mark. And if I'm being completely honest with you, I would have expected him to have had better results at Roland Garros and the US Open, given how his game style plays out. Because from an analytical point of view, you know, we're looking at, say, his Roland Garros results. He's only, like, he made the final in 2021, fine. 2020 he made the semi-finals, but apart from that, he didn't hasn't made a fourth round or better. At the US Open, he hasn't even got past the third round. And at Wimbledon, he's only made the fourth round. So Wimbledon in the US Open, he's never made even a quarter final. At the French, he's made a semi-final and final, but after that, no quarter finals. But Australian Open, he's made three semi-finals out of the five times he's played there. So his best results are down under. And why is that the case? Because if I'm being completely honest, if you were to isolate his game, you would look at it and say, okay, he's a big server, fine tick in terms of how that translates onto a quick hardcore, right? Big server, uh, so can win some free points on serve. Also, happy to, to transition forward, and is willing to come forward to the net, looks to attack the net. That's another tick, right? To a fast indoor hardcore then you'd say, okay, you know, dominant forehand, that's a tick on all surfaces, you know, serve one plus play. Again, like that's the type of tennis that is going to give you success on all surfaces. So that's not really specific to, uh, you know, outdoor hard courts or, or, or a specific tick uh, there. But that's just a general tick, you know, in terms of play. Um, but then we look at his backhand. Now, he needs time on that backhand for it to be as effective as possible. I think we've seen in the past that, you know, he does take some big cuts of the ball. And that's why he ends up shanking quite a few backhands each match because he struggles, I think, to really get to grips with um, the shortening it at times. I think he struggles to feel comfortable shortening it, in all honesty. So that then becomes very interesting because he ends up struggling to hit that drive backhand effectively and then looks to 
rely on the backhand slice as a crutch or to rely on his superior footwork to find the into out forehand more often than not. Sometimes he'll hit it into out forehand and it'll look awkward. He's not quite in the right position, but he'll hit it because he thinks that's better than hitting his backhand. Um, and you can tell he's a little bit cramped, but he'll do it anyway. Now, as I said, you know, we're talking about his serve and the way that he comes forward and volleys. He's pretty natural volleyer, transitions well. Uh, then I just talked about the fact that, well, his forehand is good on all surfaces, but of course will be good on the, at the Australian Open as well. He's able to flatten it out nicely at times and uh, take time away from his opponent. Also can hit with very good topspin and, uh, and good angles on that forehand side, which is why he's so successful on the clay uh, as well. His backhand, I've just mentioned, is uh, you know a potential weakness on the surface because opponents can can and will rush him at times on these fast courts, and uh, you know he'll be forced to try and shorten the backswing. Doesn't quite look as natural the swing when he has to do that. The other aspect of his game is his return. Now, return on the on faster courts, of course, is a lot tougher. It is. That's just part and parcel of playing on a quicker court you know he's got a fantastic serve so he gets free more free points even on his serve but then that means that on return it's tougher and he isn't a particularly natural return he's working on it i'll talk about some of the improvements he's made uh since that semi-final uh you know result at the australian open last year but generally you know the return is something that he can struggle with so uh, that is something to look out for at the australian open to see does he get drawn against some of the bigger servers uh, and if so, how would he fare? Like he, you know, big tick after playing Berrettini and coming out on top because Berrettini is a massive server. Uh, so the fact that he's come out on top there, I think is a huge positive going into the Australian Open. Uh, and he's not just limited to a serve Berrettini. He has weapons apart from that as well. So I've talked about his game. I've talked about, you know, a little bit about it and, and what he'll be looking to do. I, I've also discussed you know, how it translates onto these courts. So the big question is, well, what improvements has he made since last year and will it make a difference? And has he made any improvements or has he actually got worse? He has made improvements, I think. Uh, You know, maybe not as many improvements as, as he would have liked, but I think generally there have been improvements. The drop shot for one is been honed a lot more and I've been quite impressed by some of the use of that shot in certain patterns of play. The backhand slice, I think, looked very poor throughout a large part of 2022 at the start and then he has clearly been working on it and it is starting to look better and better. I think it is getting there. Uh, You know, I'm not saying it's a Federer-esque, Federer-esque even, backhand slice. I'm saying it's becoming serviceable you know once he can get it up to the standard of a Federer a Berrettini for example as well then that's when we're talking about something that can be used as an attacking weapon as well rather than just a rallying neutral weapon or a defensive uh, you know defensive tool to get himself out of trouble and the drive backhand now this is an interesting point because it has improved quite substantially over 2022. That's not to say that he's going to be using it, you know, really often. And, you know, he's going to opt to go backhand rather than going into out when he can on the forehand side. But he is holding his own a lot better on that side. And that was proven on the indoor hard courts for sure. Now, the added the added factor of the elements being outdoor in Australia doesn't help him, that's for sure. Uh, because being indoors of course he can focus and rely on the bounce indoors you can't always do that on outdoor courts especially with uh, some of the weather that you get nowadays with how windy the conditions can be Um, but generally I think you know that's a big big positive sign going into the Australian Open is how his backhand is coming along on top of that his return now his return was really poor in the past there's a lot of returns Shanks a lot of returns, a lot of sh- or, or very short returns that got punished. Now, what he's done is he said, okay, well, I know everyone's going to serve to my backhand. I need to make an adjustment. And what he started doing is blocking the backhand return deep into play. 
and it gets him into neutral straight away because he knows if he's able to get into the rally on the return games, more often than not, he's going to get a forehand and he's going to make them pay. So he's been a lot less stubborn, I think, on the tactics on his return. I think sometimes he would have thought, I need to take big slices because I want to get on the front foot straight away. I think sometimes when the serve is very, very good, uh, you need to respect it a bit more. I think he started to do that and in a very intelligent way and say, okay, well, I'm going to block it back, but I'm not going to block it back short or uh, give you some angle to work with. I'm going to go down the middle, uh, floated uh, with that block backhand return to give myself time to get back into position and also potentially then open up a forehand to to hurt you with. So there have been some big, big improvements there as well. There really have been, and that's been great to see. Uh, the last point, I think, before I give you guys my expectations and what his expectations will be, my last point is on his mental game. Now, I think the fact that he has beaten Medvedev uh, in the, you know a few times in 2022 is a massive, massive boost if he plays him at the Australian Open. Uh, the only person that I can think of that he would really struggle against uh, mentally just because they you know, have such a good winning record against him is Novak Djokovic. Now, of course, um, you know, Sitspas has had his moments to beat him, um, including uh, only in the last few months as well, in Paris, for example. But, but, I think that personally, Steph will be okay. He'll be okay. Um, you know, I know. You know, I know that he has lost to Novak Djokovic in those close and tight affairs, but his mental game, I think, is getting there. And then there's a lot of question marks around his dad and should his dad be in the corner, etc. You know, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Uh, but you know, I think maybe it's it's got to a point where he knows he's going to have to deal with it, and he needs to also make his own way as well, make his own mind up about things. Uh, and not just go upon what other people are saying. He's a smart individual, you can tell, and he is continually improving. And, you know, as I've said to everyone that I've talked to about Sitspas, he should be winning us at least one slam in the next couple of years. We'll see whether that materializes or not. Uh, in terms of his expectations, I think he'll go into this tournament wanting to win and, and thinking he can win if he plays some of the tennis that we know he can then you know there's not no real reason why he can't because I think he's starting to shore up the backhand side a lot better uh, and as I said has different options on the return then it means that now he has elevated himself to that next level um, in terms of you know his then expectations I think he'll be looking to make the final or win it I think he will go into this tournament saying I, I want to win it genuinely uh, and I think I have what it takes to potentially win it as well. In terms of my expectations, again, the draw plays a big part. So my final predictions in terms of players and stuff will come out when the draw comes out. But I think it's tough. There's so many you know, good players out there. Alcaraz dropping out is obviously a plus for all, all of the other top players. There's still your sinners, your Holgaroons. Let's do your quarters recently as well. Um, and then there's all the top guys, you know, Kaspar Ruud, Berrettini, uh, Zverev, all of them. I mean, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. So I think I would predict and expect him to at least make the quarterfinals, I think, is a minimum. I would be surprised if he was to win it. Uh, but uh, that's not to say he can't, because genuinely he is... Uh, you know, a fantastic player. And his results the last couple of years spelled, spelled out to me that he's been doing really good work in the preseason. Uh, he's coming to the tournament fresh, uh, but also geared up to go deep. Uh, and the fact that he's made two semifinals, given the fact that they're so quick, means that actually he's utilizing his strengths effectively on the surface and papering over the weaknesses well enough to be able to progress throughout a tournament and that's been very, very impressive. And I feel like he'll be able to do the same with this year coming, 
Can he win it? Yeah, of course he can. Whether he will, I think unlikely, but I can see another deep run coming up. Let me know your thoughts. Can Sitsipas win the Australian Open? And if not, where do you see him falling potentially as well? Of course, without a draw, it's pretty tough to predict, but uh, that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, let me know your thoughts below. As I said, remember to hit that like button and do subscribe if you're new, and we'll see you on the next video.